So, uh, welcome to an invited talk uh, at the section of mathematical physics of the ICM. And it's my great pleasure to introduce the speaker. So, the talk will be given by Professor Thierry Bourdinot from the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. Uh, he did his PhD in uh, 1977 at Diderot, supervised by Francis Comets. And since then, he made sort of a uh, many groundbreaking contributions to uh, statistical mechanics, equilibrium, non-equilibrium. Uh, but somehow, uh, six, seven years ago, he focused all his efforts onto uh, uh, sort of microscopic uh, derivation of, of uh, kinetic equations. And so this will be also the topic of uh, the talk which he will present right now with the title, uh, Convergence of a Dilute Gas to the fluctuating Boltzmann equation. Okay, thank you and welcome to the second of our ICM recorded talks. Um, for this one, maybe you save all your questions to the end. So if you want, after clapping, the recording is over and then you can freely ask for questions, any questions you have. But remember to raise your hand. It's still nice to have the microphone. Okay, so our next speaker will continue on a similar topic as before. It's Thierry Bodinot uh, about convergence of a dilute gas to the fluctuating Boltzmann equation. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like uh, to, to thank the organizer for making it possible to uh, record this, this conference uh, for the ICM. Um, I'm going indeed uh, to talk um, about um, a similar subject uh, as Laure Saint-Raymond, but the um, focus will be on the fluctuating Boltzmann equation and with a special emphasis on long time, uh, long kinetic time derivation of the fluctuating Boltzmann equation uh, starting from equilibrium initial data. So, in the first part, uh, uh, and since this uh, conference is supposed to be broadcasted in a different context, I'm going to review uh, briefly uh, the, the main notation uh, for the hard sphere dynamics, so the conference is uh, self-contained. And then I will turn to explaining uh, what is the fluctuating Boltzmann equation in two different contexts, uh, out of equilibrium and, and explain further at equilibrium what can be said and give a sketch of the, of the proof. So the starting point again is a huge billiard uh, with uh, N odd sphere. Uh, uh, which uh, follow Newton uh, dynamics. So the, the particles are uh, encoded by um, position xi, velocity vi, and we, we consider a system in dimension larger than two. Uh, the, the key feature uh, in, in this system uh, is uh, a relation between uh, the number n of particles and uh, the radius uh, of the sphere. Um, for simplicity, we consider a system in a periodic domain. Uh, each particle moved in a straight line. Um, when the two particles touch, they collide. Uh, by, um, and they, they scattered. Um, the um, relation between uh, the number of particles n and the radius uh, is given by the Boltzmann grad scaling, namely that uh, n times epsilon d minus 1 is equal to 1. And this simply means that um, on average, a typical particle has one collision per unit time. So that's what we, we, we should uh, retain. Of course, it's a very strong constraint because uh, we are now going to consider a large number of particles, namely a very uh, small uh, radius, and, and the gas will be, in this case, uh, in the dilute regime. 
Um, the, the dynamics uh, uh, is, uh, in a sense, simple to describe. Uh, we have balls with uh, velocities, uh, and uh, when, they, when they collide, they bounce uh, by elastic collision uh, with uh, momentum, uh, which is uh, preserved, and uh, the energy as well after the collision. So we're simply going to, to denote by uh, VI the uh, in vi vj the incoming velocities and vi prime vj prime the velocities after the collision when the two particles uh, collide so the the two important feature of this microscopic uh, dynamics uh, uh, it's deterministic and therefore uh, reversible so if you if you uh, look at it for a long time and then reverse the velocity you you can trace it back up to uh, its uh, original data but uh, on the other hand it's extremely unstable in the sense that if you move just one particle by a distance epsilon uh, then some collision uh, may not occur different collision with, will occur and, and the whole history of uh, the trajectory will be uh, a priori different. Um, so this can be uh, uh, a priori uh, recorded uh, in the Buville equation, which says that if one has a, a certain uh, uh, density uh, at time t for the distribution of the n particles, then uh, this uh, density evolves uh, according to a transport equation. But of course, the delicate feature of this transport equation lies in the boundary conditions, which are coding all these uh, all these reflections. Um, in order to to understand what we what we're going to um, uh, start from, I will first describe the initial data, which uh, is random, and we would like to consider. Um, the simplest type of initial data, namely independent particles uh, um, distributed with uh, some density F0. So just a, a product measure. So it can't be completely so due to the uh, interaction. P uh, particle cannot overlap. They have to remain at a certain distance from each other. So, so there's a, a little twist uh, to, to this um, uh, measure, uh, but on the whole, we, we should expect that for a dilute gas, it's essentially a product measure. Um, for for uh, the statements and for the, the convenience, uh, we, we're going to consider a grand canonical formalism. So it's exactly the same thing, except that not only the position and velocities are random, uh, initially according to this measure, uh, but the number of particles also is random. So now instead of um, um, fixing the boltzmann grad scaling in terms of the number of particles, we just use mu epsilon, which is the average of the number of particles. So the, the, the new parameter, the relevant parameter in our scaling is mu epsilon is the average of the number of particles and, and epsilon. But otherwise, it essentially is the same. Um, the, the first thing you, you would like to, to describe uh, when, when you have such a gas is what is the typical density of a particle. So for uh, um, given epsilon, uh, one has a certain number of particles and we'd like to say, okay, the particle one is distributed according to the density F1 epsilon. Um, of course, all these particles are symmetric, so describing the motion or the, the, the statistic of particle one is, is the same as describing the one of any uh, other particle. The measure is uh, exchangeable. Okay, final um, uh, result I, I wanted to, to recall uh, is uh, the so-called uh, Landfall theorem, uh, which says that under some assumption on the initial data, you, you, you want some boundedness, you want some smoothness of the initial data, you can find a certain time, strictly positive, such that the typical density of a particle converges to the solution of the Boltzmann equation. And this convergence can be made quantitative, 
uh, again, when epsilon goes to zero, when the radius of the particle shrinks, uh, uh, the number of particles goes to infinity, but under the constraint of the Boltzmann grad scaling. So uh, this is Landfall theorem, but actually it has uh, known as Landfall theorem, uh, but it has been uh, derived and completed by very, very many people, uh, including uh, a more recent result on the quantitative convergence. So I will not comment further, huh? and I would like now uh, to <clears throat> explain uh, the, um, the point of this uh, talk, namely uh, the, the fluctuating Boltzmann equation. So what Landford uh, theorem uh, says, it's actually uh, stronger than what I explained, uh, um, is that the uh, loop of large number of this deterministic dynamics uh, uh, is described uh, by the Boltzmann equation. So uh, what the Boltzmann equation tells us is uh, if initially uh, there is a, uh, some uh, distribution, uh, let's say non-homogeneous in space, for example, uh, with uh, density F0, uh, then uh, it's going to, to spread after a certain time and the average uh, uh, or the typical uh, density will be described by f of t. What we, we would like to, to understand is, um, since we start uh, uh, from some uh, discrete system uh, with a finite number of particles, uh, originally what we observe is not this uh, nice uh, curve, uh, uh, completely smooth of f0, but something uh, much more rugged, uh, which are the, the fluctuations. And what we would like to understand is how these fluctuations, this, this uh, red uh, curve, uh, evolve um, according to uh, the deterministic uh, flow. So, in a sense, we are now looking uh, at the uh, central limit theorem uh, compared to the previous result, which was uh, the law of large number. Um, how can we measure such a thing? Well, it's a central limit theorem, so we do uh, what is usually done in probability, uh, choose some test function, uh, average uh, uh, this test function over the number of particles, uh, remove the mean, uh, what should be the mean, so now at time t, uh, uh, the mean should be described by uh, the solution of the Boltzmann equation and divide by uh, 1 over square root of n. And in this regime, you, you hope that you are zooming on the red field and you hope to be able to, to, to say something on its uh, time evolution. Um, in, in what we're going to do, since the number n is random, initially we, we choose a, a random number of particles, it's better to divide by the square root of the mean instead of the square root of the n, uh, but uh, otherwise it's exactly the, 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 the natural type of uh, fluctuation we, we are used to. So z, zeta, zeta epsilon it will be called the fluctuation field. Um, the, the, the result uh, which uh, can be derived uh, um, is the following. Starting again uh, from a measure uh, with, uh, which is essentially uh, independent uh, at time zero with distribution F0, uh, one can find a time T star uh, such that uh, the fluctuation field uh, described uh, uh, before and written here, uh, converges in law uh, to um, the, the following SPDE, uh, uh, which uh, I, I wrote here and I'm going to, to comment uh, next. Um, maybe um, a, a few uh, general remarks on, on this theorem. Uh, first of all, uh, um, it has been conjectured a uh, long time ago by uh, Herbert Spohn, uh, and uh, he was also able to, to compute, for example, the, the covariance of, uh, of the noise. Um, and uh, there, there, there are counterparts of this result uh, for uh, different dynamics, uh, 
uh, with stochastic collision. Uh, these dynamics can be uh, either uh, on, at the level of the CAX model, uh, which is uh, um, a model uh, describing homogeneous Boltzmann equations so without the position and with um, um, a Markov process to mimic the collision between the particles, uh, or it can be uh, described on, on a uh, more delicate structure, uh, including as well the, poly, uh, the position, and I'm referring to work uh, by uh, Fredun uh, reza um, in, uh, in, in both cases, actually, uh, there are similarities uh, between uh, the stochastic models uh, and uh, the limit uh, which we which we found uh, starting from the deterministic dynamics, and I'm going to comment that later. Uh, let, let's, um, let me explain uh, briefly uh, how this uh, stochastic uh, uh, equation uh, is, is uh, made of. Um, there are uh, two parts. Uh, the, the first one, L of t, uh, is just a linearized uh, Boltzmann uh, operator around the solution Ft. So how, how should it be understood? Uh, it, 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 it's obtained as follow. Uh, now, um, imagine uh, uh, you, you, you start from a solution F0, uh, and you know that it evolves according to Boltzmann equation uh, uh, and uh, up to uh, some solution f of t, uh, then if you make a small perturbation in red now uh, of, of this initial solution, th this perturbation is going to spread uh, in time, and the linearized Boltzmann equation tells us how it spreads. So basically, the, the, there is a time t here, on the linearized uh, equation because it does depend on, on the density f of t. So, but it's indeed very natural to, to, to say because we, we started uh, from a perturbation of f0, which were this initial fluctuation, and they have to be transported by something, and this something deterministic is the linearized Boltzmann equation. Uh, le let me emphasize that uh, uh, Boltzmann equation uh, produces some dissipation, and linearized Boltzmann equation is also a source of uh, dissipation in, in this uh, equation. Uh, may, maybe uh, less expected, what, what we see also uh, appearing in the limit uh, is a noise. Uh, and so this noise is going somehow to, to create entropy. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, the covariance of this noise uh, was uh, already identified by uh, Herbert Spohn uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, and, and the nice feature of this covariance uh, is that um, it uh, encodes as well some dynamical correlations. So uh, we used to um, claim that uh, Boltzmann equation uh, comes from uh, chaos properties uh, that uh, two particles collide and, and then uh, at the collision time uh, we want to say that the, the density uh, factorizes because of chaos property and particles are independent. But uh, when, when we want to, to compute uh, uh, further correction, like covariance of the noise, uh, one need to, uh, to be uh, more precise uh, on this system, uh, and, and some uh, correlation are, are needed. I'll say more about that later. So let me, uh, let me maybe uh, summarize uh, uh, a few uh, important features. Uh, first of all, we, uh, the dynamics, the microscopic dynamics, is purely deterministic. So there's, there's really no noise. The only randomness uh, lies in the initial condition. However, on, on this uh, uh, equation, the noise is uh, white in space and white in time, so it really acts uh, as if at each uh, time and at each uh, position there's some uh, random process generating uh, noise. Um, the, 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 the noise is not uh, white. Uh, I mean, there's some correlation with the velocities because, of course, we have to, to preserve the, the momentum and the, the energy uh, in, the, in the collision. But, but the, the form, let's say, of the, the correlation for the noise uh, looks as follows. 
Well, uh, what is uh, very striking is that um, the same structure of the noise can be predicted from a CAX model. So you, you, you start from a, a Markovian description of the collision, uh, assume that collision happen randomly uh, uh, according to a Markov process and some, some law uh, which uh, reflects the, the action of the uh, the collision, uh, microscopic collision, uh, and and then you would uh, naturally, from this mark of process, uh, end up uh, on on some uh, similar kind of um, stochastic equation. Here, uh, the the noise is generated by the dynamics, uh, mainly by the instabilities of the dynamics, uh, but but it's it is not imposed. Uh, uh, by the microscopic um, dynamics. Just want to, to say uh, a few words on, on the proof. Uh, first of all, when uh, in probability and uh, particle system, uh, um, the, there has been very many uh, results to, to prove uh, such type of uh, convergence. And um, usually one has a martingale structure, which is embedded in the dynamics. One has a notion of filtration, uh, a, a lot of probabilistic structure, which can then be um, followed and um, emerge again uh, in, in the limit after uh, rescaling. Here, uh, we, we don't have uh, all this machinery, so we have to resort on, on the most basic uh, strategies, uh, uh, namely uh, compute the characteristic function uh, of your process. Uh, uh, as, as, as you would do for very uh, standard uh, random variables, and try to understand uh, what, this, um, what this limit uh, is. Um, it turns out that at the level of the fluctuation, the limiting process is Gaussian, so it's uh, uh, possible essentially to, to reduce everything to the two-point correlation, and then to identify what is uh, the covariance. So the, the covariance uh, codes the whole structure of the, of the limit. And this identifies the law of the process. Uh, and in a, in a second step, uh, tightness uh, is, uh, is proved in order to, 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 to strengthen the result uh, and, and to show the, the convergence to um, uh, the limiting process. Just, um, and I will not expand on that, uh, how do we handle uh, such uh, exponential of the empirical measure? Uh, we are using cluster expansion. So cluster expansion uh, is, is a very uh, strong tool. Uh, um, it can be uh, implemented at a dynamical level uh, and uh, for short time. Uh, and um, once you have cluster expansion, you, you, you can actually prove an analytic result, and in, which are, of course, suitable when you look at a characteristic function. So uh, due to the cluster expansion, we can obtain control of the characteristic function. And more generally, we can uh, obtain a better control, not only at the level of fluctuations, uh, to, to obtain uh, something on the large deviations. Oh, maybe one thing I should have mentioned, uh, uh, this time T star here is essentially of the same order as uh, the t convergence time for the Boltzmann equation. Maybe it's half of it or something like that, but it, it's uh, qualitatively uh, similar uh, in terms of this dependence uh, from the initial, uh, initial data. Okay. So now I, w I would like to, to, to focus on a, on a simpler case. Uh, uh, instead of starting uh, uh, from um, some general initial data, or some general distribution, uh, we'd like to, to start from the equilibrium measure. So what is the equilibrium measure? Uh, um, all the, uh, the particles are uniformly distributed, and all the velocities are independent and are given by a Maxwellian, same Maxwellian. And again, uh, we want to understand the fluctuation field. 
at the level of the measure, of course, it, it doesn't look <laughs> that satisfactory because you start from a stationary measure, you evolve in time, it remains the same. But uh, actually, what, what, we, what we do uh, at the probabilistic level is we start from some initial fluctuation and we want to see how it spreads dynamically. So even so, the, the system is at equilibrium, uh, uh, the fluctuations are correlated in time, and that's what we are uh, looking at. Um, maybe one, one uh, quick remark, uh, which uh, is more uh, technical. Uh, um, even if we start uh, from uh, some equilibrium measure, uh, um, it turns out that the uh, Lanford's proof uh, um, to show the convergence to the Boltzmann equation in this case uh, uh, cannot be improved. So we start from an equilibrium measure, we say that we're going to remain at equilibrium forever, but if you, if you really follow the, the path uh, which is uh, currently used to prove the convergence to the Boltzmann equation, you can only prove that you are close to equilibrium for a short amount of time. So um, it, it's not completely obvious to do perturbative results uh, around uh, equilibrium. Nevertheless, in, uh, in this regime uh, and using uh, the equilibrium structure, we, we were able, uh, in collaboration with uh, Isabel Gallagher, Laure Saint-Raymond and Sergio Simonella, uh, to prove the convergence to the fluctuating uh, Boltzmann equation uh, for uh, arbitrary long uh, kinetic time. So now time is uh, any, any time and epsilon goes to zero. Um, let me emphasize that the, the, the result I mentioned earlier uh, by uh, Fredun uh, Rezaronlou uh, was indeed proved uh, for a long time in, in uh, this equilibrium regime um, for dynamic with uh, random collisions. Um, what is uh, maybe interesting in this uh, regime uh, um, is um, that uh, the fluctuation dissipation uh, relation is, is satisfied. Uh, let me emphasize that uh, since we are at equilibrium, the linearized uh, Boltzmann operator now uh, does not depend on time, it's just uh, the standard linearized Boltzmann operator. And uh, I'll just tell you what this fluctuation dissipation means. Uh, um, imagine uh, you, you, you want to test your function, uh, your system with two functions, h and g, at time zero. Uh, it's uh, easy to, to show actually that uh, since uh, the particles are almost independent in the limit epsilon goes to zero, uh, um, uh, it's easy to compute the initial correlation. They are completely uh, uncorrelated. And, uh, now uh, you want to do the, the same thing, you want to test uh, uh, the, the field at time zero with the function h, but you want to test the field at time t with the function g. So uh, the, maybe the, the, the test function h is in this region, the function g is in this region, but the times are different. And uh, what can be shown uh, is that uh, actually, uh, I mean, th this can be, uh, the covariance can be computed, and when time goes to infinity, uh, it tends to zero, which means that uh, the, the, the fluctuation decorrelates in time, and, and this is just a feature of the dissipation of this uh, linearized Boltzmann equation. Uh, however, we started from some invariant measure, so we expect that the measure remains uh, invariant at all time, and, and at any time, uh, we, we expect the same structure of correlation. So the, the, the nice feature of the noise uh, is that it's tuned, uh, or the system tunes it, uh, I would say, exactly to, to compensate uh, this, uh, uh, this dissipation of the linearized operator. Um, I will not comment further, but um, the, the way the, the theorem was stated uh, for simplicity, the time was fixed, arbitrarily large, and then epsilon goes to zero. There is little room there, uh, and one can consider uh, times which are diverging on a kinetic scale. Not diverging much, maybe like log, log, log of epsilon, but 
okay, still diverging, and, and through this divergence, uh, um, the uh, hydrodynamic scaling uh, can be reached, uh, and we, we can get um, convergence to the fluctuating Stokes equation and Fourier uh, equation. During the, the last part of the talk, I would like to, to tell you now um, uh, a few um, ideas uh, of the proof and how we, we prove the convergence to this uh, fluctua limiting fluctuating uh, Boltzmann equation. So the, the, the proof is in two steps. The, the first one uh, are not detailed, and uh, essentially it's a tightness argument. So we we prove that uh, th there should be convergence to, to something. The, the, the process is tight. And the, the main issue uh, it will be to characterize uh, the uh, limit on the law of the, of the limiting process. Again, we, we don't have any probabilistic tools, martingales or whatever, so we have to resort uh, to, to the most uh, basic tools uh, uh, to, to identify uh, a Gaussian law, and we're going to prove that the weak rule uh, is satisfied. So what is the weak rule? It goes as follows. You choose a certain number of time, theta 1, theta 2, theta k, a certain number of functions, uh, h1, h2, hk, and you're going to test your system at uh, this time, this time, and this time take the product of all the f corresponding fluctuation fields, uh, and uh, Vicrol will tell us that uh, this uh, product of k function uh, can be indeed decomposed uh, in terms of products of two functions, just the covariance, uh, uh, over all the possible pairings, uh, and since uh, there is some epsilon, the system is indeed uh, at fixed epsilon, it's not Gaussian at all, uh, uh, there is an error which can be quantified. So, when you go to the limit, uh, uh, the, the limiting process has to uh, satisfy uh, the Vic rule from which we, we know that it's Gaussian. And it remains only to understand after its covariance, uh, uh, which is here in order to, to fully uh, characterize the, the limit. Um, so the, the covariance uh, um, can be, um, or will have the, the following form. Uh, now uh, we test only uh, at time zero and at, at time theta, two, func two test functions, h0, h1. Uh, and uh, the covariance is somehow uh, obtained in terms of the semi-group generated by the linearized Boltzmann operator. So that's why the covariance uh, decays in, in time. So th this result uh, on the covariance was uh, first obtained by uh, Van Bejren, Landford, Lebowitz, and Spoon, uh, but it was again uh, limited to short time uh, uh, short time as the same order as uh, the one for the convergence to the Boltzmann equation. And uh, some time ago, we were able to derive it in dimension two. Uh, um, but uh, now, uh, what I'm going to, 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 to say uh, holds in, in dimension uh, three also and higher. So the summary of the proof, uh, we, we want uh, to show that uh, the uh, limiting process is fully uh, characterized, uh, first by the weak rule, uh, and uh, second uh, by uh, explicit form of the covariance. So we, we are going to compute such, uh, such type of uh, quantities. Um, in particular, there we have to compute it for uh, any uh, okay, reasonable test function, any, any k. Um, how do we proceed? Let's start with, uh, with the covariance. Um, so, uh, to, to, to explain the, the procedure, uh, we're going to, to choose fluctuation field of this form and suppose that the function h uh, as mean zero, so I don't I don't want to subtract this uh, this its mean, uh, but the the typical fluctuation field will will look like that, uh, and the product of two fluctuation fields uh, is just the product of n particles 
with respect to the function h0 and n particle with respect to the function h1. So this uh, I just want to, uh, to express in terms of uh, n particles in blue, which are here, and n particles in green. And I just want to uh, compute uh, the, the terms of, of this product. So there are two types of terms. Either you choose twice the same particle, you know, so you get a, a diagonal uh, contribution uh, when you, you have i and i in both functions, or uh, you choose two different particles, uh, uh, you have cross terms, uh, but then uh, you have many cross terms, of course, but then uh, uh, you know that uh, initially the, the measure is uh, essentially a product, uh, so uh, this term will, will not uh, contribute. Uh, and in the limit, uh, it remains only uh, this diagonal term, which, which gives you this, this type of pairing. So we, we would like to do the same thing now at uh, two different times. Uh, so again, uh, uh, I've, um, I've chosen uh, this si sim simpler form, uh, and, and the particles uh, for, for this uh, part of the fluctuation field uh, are in blue here, and the, 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 the other one for the initial field are, are in, uh, in, red, uh, in green. Um, however, it's the same particle, uh, as I said, in both cases, so we, we have to do the pairing and understand uh, how it goes. So, uh, in between, uh, of course, this, this, um, uh, now there is time uh, and there, there are dynamical correlations. And uh, we, we, we have no idea, a priori, uh, in the previous argument it was easy, all the particles were taken at time zero, now um, we have to understand how this particle could correlate uh, with these ones. Um, so the, maybe to, to, to uh, picture, to give some, some idea, uh, we have to imagine that to understand the motion of this particle, uh, uh, it's going to evolve, involve a certain number of particles initially due to the collision. So there are ways uh, somehow, through, uh, for example, BBGK or hierarchy, to project uh, the um, action of the dynamics or the effect of the dynamics on one particle uh, and to say that uh, the evolution here uh, will be given by a certain number of particles there. So this, this will be uh, our dynamical correlation. Actually, when I look at this one, what I, I'm looking at at time zero is a function phi k depending possibly on k particle. And k is a random number. It really depends on time, depends on, on, on many things. Um, so instead of uh, looking at this simple structure between um, correlation at different times, uh, we prefer somehow to look at a more complicated um, uh, fluctuation field, uh, but at the same time, so now the, the new fluctuation field is, is not uh, at time theta with respect to the function h1, uh, but it's a more complicated uh, fluctuation field, but at time zero, depending on a certain number of parameters. So the, the fluctuation or the covariance between two time can be um, projected or written, say, in terms of the covariance at time zero, but between a, a more complicated structure due to the dynamics and potentially a certain number of parameter um, uh, of particles. So that's. Uh, where, where things uh, start to, to get complicated because we would like to, to look at these things at very large time and, and the larger the time, uh, the bigger this cone of influence will be uh, and uh, we, we have to make sure that the K is, uh, is controlled or otherwise we'll, we'll be very much in trouble and um, already with k particle uh, when when you do the expansion you, you see many correlation with your in your system but if k is very very large then then it's delicate so we we can't really do it this way we we have to to proceed in a much more controlled uh, manner uh, and um, look at the influence uh, uh, on one particle uh, step by step, uh, just to make sure that the number k is not growing too much. So, so the, the, the idea huh, 
is uh, to go back in time uh, and see um, what is the influence on this particle, say, of, uh, of the other particles. And maybe in between uh, time theta and time zero, uh, I will have to stop at some point because uh, I have too many collisions or the, 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 the things get too atypical uh, and, and there'll be no way uh, to uh, go back up to time zero if we um, uh, try to, to transport this bad event. And, and the, the, the strategy uh, uh, is somehow so to, to control this backward propagation uh, of uh, the dynamical information and to stop at time t in order to, to remove spurious events, namely too many collisions or uh, recollisions. Um, one, um, one maybe key feature uh, of the proof uh, um, is that um, I've described this cone as the influence of other particles on one single particle. And indeed, uh, this cone can be um, obtained by um, uh, iterated um, uh, GML uh, uh, expansion or in terms of uh, BBGKY hierarchy. And usually when you, when you uh, use the BBGKY hierarchy, you, uh, you look at one typical particle and, and see how this typical particle is affected by uh, the, the other particles in this cone. So there, uh, should we do that, um, we wouldn't be able uh, uh, to make the most of the invariant structure. Okay, so um, what, uh, what we have to do is uh, use the averaging over um, all, uh, all these functions phi k, use a lot of symmetries somehow uh, uh, in order uh, uh, to average uh, the, the potential uh, problems in the dynamics. And um, time decoupling uh, is extremely uh, difficult in general to, uh, to obtain because um, here uh, we, we have an information now at time t and not at time theta and an information at time zero, but I didn't tell you how to relate these two times. So there uh, we are going to use the fact that we are at uh, equilibrium measure, that the, uh, the, the invariant measure is indeed invariant, uh, and split the two contributions uh, with the simplest argument you can imagine, uh, which is Cauchy-Schwarz estimate. So now uh, we have something under the invariant measure, something here under the invariant measure, uh, and, and all the difficulty, because this phi k is relatively complicated, is to uh, estimate uh, this type of bad event uh, using a lot of the symmetrization in the system and uh, a lot of uh, averaging. So um, we use the invariant measure as a way to have a form of a local equilibrium from which uh, we are able to, to cut uh, the measure at any time. Um, maybe one way I just told you um, what are the difficulty now when you want to prove Vick rule. Uh, um, we don't have only two times, uh, we have many times, uh, and we have possible pairing between different times. So let's say I start from the uh, latest time and look at the influence cone here uh, up to time theta 2. And then I have to look at the pairing between uh, this cone here and possibly other particles. But maybe the, the pairing will not happen between uh, a function H3 and H2, but uh, in, in, in these terms, the, the pairing can happen between a very different time. And so there are uh, multiple cones uh, of influence uh, which are transported and we have to understand how they, they interact uh, um, in order to, to show uh, how, how the, uh, the pairing happens uh, in the Vick rule. So again, uh, um, these intertwined pairings and the dynamical interactions uh, they're handled by a local type of uh, cluster expansion uh, and, um, and um, other um, uh, tools uh, in order to, to control the dynamics uh, locally. 
Um, maybe I will conclude because time is up. Uh, so, um, in summary, uh, we have discussed uh, the, the fluctuating uh, Boltzmann equation. We've shown uh, uh, that um, uh, stochastic correction emerge uh, in the limit uh, uh, after the, the main uh, term, which is the Boltzmann equation. Uh, these corrections are uh, very similar to the one obtained uh, uh, or which could be guessed from stochastic models, um, and they, they satisfy the, the basic uh, uh, physic, uh, physical relation uh, which were uh, expected. Uh, um, this result, which I tried to describe, are uh, valid um, at long time, uh, starting from equilibrium and even uh, partly di or diverging kinetic time, so um, further results can be uh, obtained from, from those. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thierry, for this very interesting talk on the newest developments on the field. Uh, we have time for uh, short questions. Okay, let's see, please. Can you use the microphone? How how large is your cave? And you say then uh, that this in, in the, the, the large the, cave. It, it will be uh, truncated as log of uh, one so of our epsilon. So it's so log it's, it's, but yes. it's still it's still better than the BBG cave I. Because the BBG cave I also, I think it would be also log M. No? Uh, yes, uh, the, the, the BBGKY, uh, also uh, one of the things I didn't um, detail is that uh, the BBGKY uh, is usually controlled in terms of L infinite norms, uh, and there uh, what we really use are uh, L2 uh, averaging. On the other hand, the, uh, the image is somehow much weaker than the description of a density function uh, from the BBGKY hierarchy because what we get uh, are only um, uh, average uh, result of the type of uh, uh, weak rules. So we, we, we cannot uh, describe um, uh, precisely densities or we, we, we have averaging and thanks to this averaging, uh, certain bad events can be can be swung. Great. Thank you very much. Once more. Uh... Well. Uh, thank you. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, so uh, uh, well, the audience is Helsinki clapped already, but so I also want to thank you for you know very beautiful talk, and uh, uh, I guess uh, that uh, sort of closes that particular session. So thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Herbert. And if there are any questions, please don't hesitate to send me a, an email. Thank, thanks a lot. Okay, you're welcome. All right, the, the okay. lab session.